The Farm Mudjigonga, Episode 5. It's 7am, the sun has just peaked over the mountains and the birds are chirping. Today's chat, we will delve a little further into the meaning of a social farm. Good morning, Judy. Good morning on this beautiful morning, Darren, as the sun rises over these majestic hills. Thanks for jumping in early and thanks for the coffee. Now, a care farm or a social farm? Well, it's a bit of both, I think, to be honest. And, and I suppose you can get caught up in semantics. And, but when I first started going down the path of looking at you know, what I might do with the farm and how I might diversify, I came across this notion of a care farm quite commonly and certainly care farming is a thing you know there's there's quite a bit of literature on care farming there are some care farms have been um, established in Australia on, very different to what I'm trying to do but this notion of care farming uh, had some sort of uh, understanding I suppose so that was where I was, where I started but as I did this Churchill Fellowship I was lucky enough to go and look at care farming in Europe and, in, and across, because it's pretty much everywhere in the world other than Australia. So the US, Canada, um, you know, South Korea, Japan, all through Europe, uh, care farming is, is quite well established. I came across this notion of social farming as well. And I, I just identified more that that was really what I was trying to do. And I, I, the only way to explain it is to say social farming is pretty much opening the gates to sharing your farming experience with, with other people. It's not a particular group, not anyone. Uh, there's no sort of agenda around it. It's literally sharing your farm on a social, uh, like, a, like a community garden or a social garden. And as I said, in Ireland, it's always called social farming. Usually it's small family farms because that's traditionally what Ireland is that open their doors to small groups of people or, or individuals or whatever, not, not on a very big scale. Care farming can be on quite a big scale. And in fact, even in Australia, where we've had a couple of uh, organisations running care farms, as Mansfield Autism Centre at the moment are building a care farm, on, but a residential care farm. Mission Australia have had a, a care farm for uh, teenagers uh, outside Sydney for some years. and again, residential and, and, and on a big scale. And what I'm talking about is a small scale, literally a normal family farm, opening the door, sharing what you're doing and creating a community around your farm. For people in particular like adult autism or the aged care? Or... Well, I think that the truth is it's for anyone. And so if you build the farm such that anyone can access it, it doesn't have to be for any one group, it'll be for whoever needs to or wants to access it. So. Universal design means, you know, creating a, 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 a place that anyone can go, no one is excluded. I think there are some groups that will benefit more than others and certainly people with disabilities are often excluded from, from going places, having outings, uh, being able to participate in nature and, and walks and, and, you know, physical exercise and activities. So I want the farm to be somewhere that no one is excluded. People you know, aged care facilities, it's, it's hard getting people around. They need to have paths, they need to have, you know, flat surfaces, they need to have wheelchair accessible, mobility accessible bathrooms. They need all these things. So they're excluded just by virtue of the fact that most buildings can't cope with people that have those specific needs. So my idea was not to open the farm to any one group, but to open the farm to anyone for whom it would be a benefit. Obviously I can't have a thousand people here every day, it can only be small groups, it has to be managed, but the idea is for no one to be excluded. So for, for mental health or it's therapeutic? Yeah, so again, care farming by its nature is therapeutic farming. That's if, if you look up the definition of care farming, it's therapeutic farming, it's, it's a word that they use interchangeably. So in history we've always known that farming and nature and being in the open spaces, being in the outdoors is very good for your mental health. You know, we talk about it being, uh, as I said, in, in the UK they talk about not the national health but the natural health prescription. We know that it can really help people that are struggling mentally, that need some time out, that need somewhere to go for some quiet or some healing or the power of animals or whatever it might be, and also to be part of uh, nature in another community. So 
it has a whole lot of benefit. The benefits are undeniable and the research will tell us. It's just how do you bring that to people when we're a very urbanised society. Most of our people live in cities and getting people out to farms is very difficult. And then getting people once they're on the farm to be able to access the farm, those that really need it, whether it is mental people with mental health. I mean, how are they going to find a farm that they can go to? How are they going to access nature? They can't simply just, you know, a lot of people don't drive. You know, there are long distances in Australia. So you've actually got to create something that has a system where you can bring people out and you can provide for their needs. And, and I think that's really what I'm trying to model here on the farm. So when I've been uh, visiting these care farms and social farms overseas, I've seen programs for people, lots of different groupings. As a, a lot of as a beautiful care farm in the UK for veterans with PTSD, uh, solely designed for veterans with PTSD, run by a veteran. An incredible situation, uh, very, very powerful. And I'd love to engage with the veteran community. There are so many different groupings can, can benefit from, but, but the truth is all of us can benefit from social farming. So I don't want to say it's any one group, I simply want to say it's accessible to anyone that needs it or feels they need it, uh, you know, within the boundaries of what's reasonable. And you've got to be very broad minded, don't you? Like in episode one, you said cater for everybody. Again, it, it's almost the reverse that no one is excluded rather than cater for every, well, cater for everybody, it's the same thing, but within the boundaries of the fact that it's one farm and I'm one person um, and, and there is a, a limit to to how many people can access the farm. So, you know, I'd like to think that um, I'm just one farm and I encourage other people to think about opening their farms as well because we have so much to share that could be of, of benefit to people and could actually break down a lot of the barriers that I think happen in, in rural Australia, that city country divide and, and at times inaccurate portrayal of people who are farming. We're our own worst enemies sometimes, Darren. I, I think uh, if I share with you my, my the, the philosophy that, that one of the, the, the things that actually set me on this journey, and I, I've talked before about my love of Joel Salatin, but, uh, in, and I hope he's not listening to this, but anyway, <laughs> he does come out occasionally to Australia. But um, there, are, there are a lot of gurus of the, the regen uh, agriculture world and, and it, I'm not a it, this is not about regen it's simply about a philosophy of sharing and and he talks about this notion of uh, opening our farms and that we grew up with and we see it everywhere you know people whose farms have more signs on their gates saying do not enter uh, biosecurity take your shoes off ring this number do not proceed past here stop now come in here and you'll be in trouble, whatever. And, and it, we certainly grew up with a sign on the gate that said trespassers will be prosecuted, which was the, 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 the common sign you could buy at the rural stores, trespassers will be prosecuted. My, my mother had another one which said, mind the agapanthus, which I thought was far, far more subtle. But um, Joel Saladin talks about instead of saying trespassers will be prosecuted, he has a sign that says trespassers will be impressed. And I think that just resonated with me so clearly that instead of stopping people coming to your farm and then they can say, well, the reason they don't want us in is because they're mistreating animals or they're, they're doing something they don't want us to see or they're not farming properly or they're not treating the environment well or whatever. That's what it implies. It implies there's something behind that gate that I don't want you to see. And we're going through that with animal activism at the moment and abattoirs and all sorts of you know, live sheep and cattle trade and this um, distortion of fact on both sides because there's no middle ground. But in fact, if we just opened our farms and could show people what we do as farmers and how we love our animals and how we want to grow, you know, good pasture and look after the soil and, and how we want to leave the place better than we found it. And the things, if we could show people that, I think we could go a long way to, to changing some of this, the perceptions about agriculture. Now, I'm not saying that biosecurity of farms is not absolutely important. Um, you know, Australia is an island and, and we're you know, very lucky to be free of many of the problems that other agricultural nations have and preserving our clean, 
pure food and protecting our animals is, is absolutely everything. But every farm, you know, it needs biosecurity rules. We need a biosecurity plan. We need to control the vulnerable sites on the farm. We need to protect the animals. Access has to be planned, it has to be managed. And whether that be, you know, pathways, clear pathways, whether it be through education, disinfecting, washing shoes, whatever it has to be done, that's really important. But that doesn't mean people can't come and visit your farm. And so it's that balance between having no one and having everyone. And if you're having everyone, actually controlling where they go. You know, we talked in the last episode a bit about wildlife corridors. I sort of see the access to farms a bit like wildlife corridors. You sort of create where you want people to be. And if they're off the path, then they've got to follow your plan. So just to protect everyone. I was lucky enough to work with Joel Salatin one day, just here in Stanley actually. Uh, and he, he's an incredible man. He thinks very differently and thinks simply, and often the answer's right in front of us. It's just we're thinking too far away from that. I found that, that, that one thing that he said, trespassers will be impressed, it, it sits in my head every day. And I think if someone's going to come through the gate, I want them to think, wow, look at the trees she's planted. Look at this beautiful soil. Look at these healthy, happy animals. Look at these people enjoying that farm. That's what I want people to see. And, and if I can create that through social farming, um, I think you know, that will give me a lot of, of joy and make me feel my life's been a bit worthwhile. Well, you're keeping nature at our doorstep here, Judy. It's just such an incredible big thing you're doing here. And thank you because it's all for, not for you, it is for other people and you're very kind and caring. I, I, I'm not sure that it's about anything other than the fact it seems the right thing to do. It just seems such a logical thing to do. I've been so lucky to be born and bred on a, a beautiful property, which has had its absolute challenges. We've lived through drought and flood and bushfire and, and you know, we've always had to work off farm as well. We've all worked very, very hard to keep the farm going. It's it's not an easy life. It's not a, you know, there's no, no you know, loafing around when you're farming. But it is a beautiful life if you, you know, realise how you're surrounded by, you know, the greatest things that nature can, can offer you. And, uh, you know, the seasons, the trees, the, the birds, the bees, the butterflies, the animals, the whole getting up with the sun and watching the sun set in the afternoons and, you know, watching the stars at night. All the things that living on a farm, it gifts you. Um, so it gives you some other things that you'd rather not have occasionally. Uh, we could do with a drop of rain at the moment, but I'm not going to start whinging about that because I have learnt that there's absolutely nothing I can do about that one. A fascinating chat. How do people get some more information? Darren, our website is the, the farmmudgigonga.com.au and we'll be putting progressively putting information up on that website. It'll be a living website where you, they'll be tracking things happening at the farm and, and how you can be involved. And there's lots of different ways people can be involved, even other than, than coming out. Because as I said, it, we won't be able to manage big groups of people. That would take away from the whole idea of, of having a small, intimate community on the farm each day. But once you're part of our community, there will be other things you can see on the website. You can track some of the animals, you can hear what's going on, you can participate in, in other ways and learn how to book for different things that are happening. Um, we can't just open the door and have 100 people turn up. We can't manage that. So it, there will be a booking system and people will have to follow the website for that sort of information. We're only a few months away, perhaps from opening date, so there's lots of work to do and we're going to have a few more episodes in between then. But Thanks again for your chat, Judy. Have a great day. Thank you and you have a great day here on God's Own Country, Darren.